it's very likely to be something that took place in Bolivia uh, and that ended in Bolivia. Yoel points out 51% in a field of fives. So yes, yeah, so not even just a plurality, but a solid majority in a field of five. John says to add, to expand to that, with things like the CIA, it is sort of leftist American, it is a sort of leftist American exceptionalism that the US is uniquely responsible for every bad thing ever. Yeah, I, I agree, I agree. And it, it, in addition to that, I think that it denies the agency that we, we normally would attribute to actors and it doesn't give them a chance to make those decisions on their own. And um, it assumes that everything is just kind of imported. Can we hear from some others about why the Bolivian election matters before we get started? Thanks, Ishan. Appreciate that. Check out that later. Okay, so let's get started. We have a very interesting discussion in store for us today and um, gives us a chance to address something that we haven't really said much about so far, but that has been hovering over our discussions and that has often been a, a key part of, of, of what we've talked about. And that is democracy promotion in general and US democracy promotion in particular. Now, we're right smack dab in the middle of a conversation about the international determinants of democratization. And we've talked about everything from war to diffusion to uh, changes in the Catholic Church to global crises, all the way down to foreign aid and other factors like this. But what we haven't talked about is the promotion of democracy in other countries by other countries. And this brings us to the most important democracy promoter at all, of all, which is the United States. And when we come to this issue, you'll often see bumper stickers like this, who um, say, for example, be nice to America or we'll bring democracy to your country. You might see something like this, where the choice between democracy and alternatives to democracy uh, brings a hail of gunfire. Maybe you'll see something like this. If you don't come to democracy, democracy will come to you. We'll bomb the freedom into you. And this is obviously meant to be tongue in cheek, uh, but there's clearly an element of truth and an element of kind of um, cynicism involved and related closely to U.S. imperialism and U.S. efforts to disguise the promotion of its economic and foreign policy interests with the promotion of democracy. And these are some of the themes that we'll deal with today. We'll get to the question about whether democracy promotion promotes democracy or something else, what the intentions of democracy promotion are, why democracy promotion has been more important at certain moments than others, how it's changed over time, what it is, and why it's distinctively American, and why the United States in, in particular has, has promoted democracy while so many other countries have made it less of a priority. I want you to be thinking about, again, that level of analysis issue, that difference between the international and the domestic level of analysis, and how moving from one level to another implies changing the social structure and how that means then that the actors involved at the different stages or the different levels also change. So that international level of analysis, it includes the United States, other superpowers, international agencies, non-governmental organizations. It includes a whole host of different entities that don't exist inside states, but what does take place inside states is that process of democratization itself. And so remember then that that level of analysis issue involves moving from the international level of analysis to the domestic level of analysis. And let's then begin to think about this concept of, of democracy promotion. In, the, in a moment, we will define what this means and we'll talk about some of the issues involved and some of the ways that democracy is, is promoted. So democracy promotion, the United States especially, 
uh, excuse me, countries, the United States especially, tend to push for democracy in other countries. Now, what does that mean? That means they exert pressure, they try to bring about democratic transitions or the survival of democracy in other countries. They try to use leverage or linkages that they have to influence politics in those other countries in a way that will bring about or will preserve democracy. But the question that always hovers over democracy promotion is, is democracy itself the real goal? You know, what is the real motivation? Is it really about bringing about democracy? Or is there some other objective that lurks behind and that is sort of motivating these actors? After all, why does the United States care what kind of a regime some other country has? What reason do they have to care? It could be that maybe there are business or economic or foreign policy interests that can be better served by a democracy, or maybe the democracy promotion itself can help to serve those interests quite apart from what regime change does or does not take place. And so one example in a, a provocative example, but one that is close to home and that we can easily see for ourselves is the example of the invasion of Iraq. If you remember, the invasion of Iraq was initially justified on the basis of democracy promotion. Excuse me, hold on. <clears throat> the invasion of Iraq was initially justified on the basis of finding weapons of mass destruction. But when those weapons of mass destruction were not found, the justification shifted and the justification became democracy promotion. Now, why is that significant? Because the invasion itself on the grounds of finding weapons of mass destruction was also flimsy. And there were questions from the very beginning about whether there was any evidence of all of those weapons of mass destruction, or at least enough to compel that intervention on that basis. When that justification went away, well, clearly there couldn't be anything as compelling as potential weapons of mass destruction. So wouldn't the US back out at that point? Well, at that point, they began to focus on democracy promotion in instituting democracy in, in Iraq. And so the question then remains, is democracy the real goal? And was finding weapons of mass destruction the real goal? It does democracy promotion serve other, some other purpose? What is the objective? What is the potential outcome that, that they're trying to bring about through democracy promotion? And so, what I want you to see from this so far is that democracy promotion is not just another foreign policy or another instrument or, or sort of idealist vision. It's, it's actually central to US political identity. It's part of a sense of national purpose that stretches back as, as far as we can really remember. For example, manifest destiny was used as a sort of justification for imperialistic democracy promotion like practices in Latin America. These practices go back far, far in time. And it suggests that democracy promotion might be a useful foil or a useful lens or justification for all kinds of intervention that might serve all sorts of different interests, political, economic, but may not be as concerned with democracy as it purports to, to be. I'm gonna check the chat here before we continue. Martin says it typically has to do with pro-globalist forces such as exec executives from Bush Jr. to Obama. From an international view, it is beneficial to have more liberal democracies within the world as it's less likely to have rival states such as rogue, rogue states and spoiler states. Martin, what is a pro-globalist force? That's the only question I would have. Uh, but I, I, I do tend to see your point that from uh, an international view, it is beneficial to have more liberal democracies within the world. But what is an international view? Do you mean from the view of of administrations that are integrated or linked with, with international actors more so than other administrations. The only thing I'm wondering about is, you know, why is it that, that having more democracies in the world um, benefits, you know, Bush Jr. and Obama? Um, I'm just curious. <laughs> 
Martin says, forces that support the lowering of tariffs and barriers to migration, et cetera. Okay, so maybe promoting democracy helps to promote global economic integration in ways that would be beneficial to those states that rely on global economic integration. Okay, so maybe states that want to export their products or be able to obtain imports more cheaply. Um, okay, I understand that. That's, that's an, an argument that you could make, right? Certain kinds of, of administrations or certain governments that rely on certain kinds of economic interests that rely on the global economy might think that democracies are better for their interests if that means that their interests will be better protected in foreign countries that are democratic and they'll be protected from ex, um, expropriation or, um, or other kinds of state, state behavior that we would consider predatory. Remember that we did learn that in a democracy, the property in the capital of powerful rich people are better protected their right to that property in that capital is better protected because elections and accountability mean that the state cannot engage in expropriation at least as easily as it could in say an authoritarian regime where there's far less in terms of accountability and where elections don't often matter at this point you're probably asking an important question which is what is democracy promotion how can we define that what do we actually mean and the definition I have for you today is that democracy promotion is any set of foreign relations and development cooperation ini initiatives which seek to contribute to the development and consolidation of democracy in other countries. So what this definition implies is that we have two countries at the very least, maybe many countries. We have a first country or a home country that designs a policy of democracy promotion that home or first country then undertakes foreign policies or development cooperation activities or initiatives that seek to bring about democracy and solidify democracy in third countries or other countries. So in the example of the United States and Latin America, the US would be the first country and the foreign policy would be democracy promotion. And the third countries would be countries like Venezuela, Nicaragua, uh, maybe, maybe Bolivia until recently, until yesterday technically. Um, maybe Guatemala, all of those countries are authoritarian regimes at present with the exception of Bolivia. But once we define democracy promotion, we've got to distinguish between hard and soft democracy promotion. So soft democracy promotion takes the form of democracy assistance and persuasion, financing for elections, maybe persuasion or arguments for or against certain policies that might help or hinder democracy or electoral processes, diplomatic pressure in the form of talks between diplomats, political conditionalities in the form of maybe making entrance into a regional organization that the United States controls uh, conditional on democratization, maybe the threat of sanctions if democracy is not undertaken all of these are examples of soft democracy promotion. Hard democracy promotion is the use of coercive power to try to bring about democracy. This is full-blown military intervention, using coercive force, boots on the ground, to bring about or try to bring about democracy. Sanctions in the form of economic sanctions, maybe the freezing of bank accounts, um, sanctions on the export or the import of goods, embargoes like that which has been imposed on Cuba going back more than half a century. All of these are examples of hard democracy promotion. These are instances where the first country, the democracy promoter, chooses the most aggressive means possible to try to bring about democratization. And what's ironic is that that military intervention or those sanctions, that coerciveness, stands in contrast to the more consensual and cooperative nature of democracy itself. So it's kind of like, oh, we'll bomb the freedom into you. You know, a critical, cynical take would be, you know, democracy, you must accept it or we'll bring it to you. Um, seems inconsistent with, with what we consider to be democratic if we, consider to, what to, if we consider democracy being about cooperation and consent, sovereignty, et cetera. There's also another thing I wanna consider here and, and put in your head before we continue. Remember, 
that one of the conditions of democracy is that decisions are not made by some external actor in that only actors inside the polity, elected officials are, are deciding and making choices. If democracy itself is made or is forced upon a country from the outside, more or less, that seems to be a violation of sovereignty or in a very limited sense, it seems to be inconsistent with the sovereign sort of independent decision-making on the part of elected officials that we associate with, with democracy. So democracy promotion defined this way and distinguished in terms of hard and soft democracy promotion already raises a number of questions about the efficacy or, or the, the sort of motivations or really the results of democracy promotion. And as we continue, I want to outline a couple different normative perspectives on US democracy promotion. Now, normative is a, is a, is a weighty term that I don't, want, I don't want to insult anyone's intelligence. It's very likely that we know what this means, but um, in case we don't, normative means that it's what we should do as opposed to what is, what should be as opposed to what is. If an analytical perspective is what is, a normative perspective is what should be. And so there are really two different normative perspectives on US democracy promotion. The first is exemplarism, and the second is vindicationalism. And we'll talk about each of these in turn and, and what they mean, and we'll eventually get to some examples, and we'll eventually have a discussion about whether exemplarism or vindicationalism are, are better perspectives on, on democracy promotion. And so the first perspective on democracy promotion, exemplarism, sees the United States as really above the balance of power system, as being really above the old world politics that we associate with this kind of hard-headed democracy promotion, kind of bullying countries into, into transitioning to democracy. Exemplarism sees the United States as morally superior to this kind of behavior. It suggests that the United States should really focus on perfecting its own institutions and values through isolation, not through spreading the gospel of democracy and spreading the word of democracy. The idea is that the US exerts influence on the world through the force of example, and that other countries may or may not learn from that example, but that they should not be forced or persuaded or cajoled into learning from that example. And this perspective even goes further and says that an activist foreign policy may even corrupt liberal practices at home and undermine the potency of the US model. That is to say that, look, not only does an activist foreign policy in the form of democracy promotion leave the United States itself less capable of perfecting its own institutions and values, it may even corrupt those practices. It may contaminate them, so to speak. It may make them less sustainable. It may contribute to their deterioration. So this is an isolationist stance on democracy promotion. This is the normative stance that says no to democracy promotion. And so as important as democracy promotion is to the US legacy and to the US sort of approach, it's not the case that all perspectives value it equally. Exemplarism says that democracy promotion should not be pursued whatsoever. Now there's a second perspective and that is vindicationalism. And I've already identified this, but let's now talk about it a little bit more. So vindicationalism shares exemplarism's city on a hill identity for the US. That is to say the US is special, it's exceptional, its values, its institutions, et cetera, stand above all others. But it takes another point of view and reaches a different conclusion than that first type. It argues that the US must move beyond example. It argues that the US's institutions and values should be spread and should be disseminated and that the United States should not just be an isolated example, but an active, active, component of a process of democracy promotion and that the US above all should be at the forefront of democracy promotion. And so these active measures to spread universal political values and institutions should be a constant feature 
of US foreign policy. This is a very different perspective than that exemplarism. And it goes further because it says that isolationism itself is, is problematic. And instead we should be interventionist and we should be actively involved in promoting democracy, whatever that means and whatever that looks like in practice. So let's take a look then at some different eras of democratization. Remember that there are three waves of democratization and that these waves are a useful means of differentiating between different eras. Now that first wave, remember, lasted for about 100 years between the early 1800s and the, and the sort of mid to early 1900s. And so during this period, this first wave era, the US was very much involved in vindicationalism. And not just that, they were very much involved in using hard power to promote democracy. So during the period between 1898 and 1934, the US launched more than 30 military interventions in Latin America alone under a policy of promoting democracy. Now, interestingly, not a single one of these interventions led to the inst inst installation of democracy, not a single one not a single one. And so we'll discuss some cases, but in a broad sense, we can identify the experiences of Nicaragua where American forces occupied almost continuously from 1909 to 1934, with the exception of 1911. Haiti where US troops lingered from 1915 to 1934. And the Dominican Republic where the United States established military rule from 1916 to 1924. Now, what's interesting is that military intervention and military rule seem to be associated with democracy during this period of democracy promotion. Not associated in the sense that they brought about democracy, but in the sense that the United States viewed military intervention in the in installation of a military regime, in the case of Dominican Republic, as ingredients in the eventual transitions to democracy that would take place in these countries. But as we can see, those transitions never took place. And so this first wave era, characterized by hard democracy promotion, characterized by aggressive vindicationalism, was ultimately unsuccessful <clears throat> in bringing about what was, at least on paper, its stated purpose of spreading democracy, spreading the gospel of democracy. Let's take a look at some different cases that help to show this in all of its detail. The first case that is noteworthy is the case of Nicaragua. And as I mentioned, between 1909 and 1933, United States troops marched on Nicaragua almost every single year except for 1911. And during this time, the United States, while sort of superficially promoting democracy and elections, et cetera, was also supporting the dependable but corrupt conservative party. And the conservative party was closely linked with business and economic interests who were aligned with the United States. The United States had also engaged in extensive foreign direct investment. There were a lot of private business interests and actors in the US who had investments in, in, the, in Nicaragua. And this meant then that there was a lot at stake for the US and for US business interests. Now, support for the conservative party that aligned with those interests gave rise to a guerrilla insurgency led by a man named Cesar Augusto Sandino. The Sand Sandinistas were the result of this, this formation of a guerrilla insurgency. And the Sandinistas became iconic for their struggle against US intervention. Now, support for the conservatives and under the guise of promoting democracy now meant battling the guerrillas. And in Nicaragua, this promotion of democracy that involved battling the guerrillas and supporting a corrupt repressive party uh, eventually gave way to a truly atrocious uh, and embarrassing outcome for the United States. The U.S. Marines lost 130 men. It brought attacks on U.S. interests. Over time, the, the intervention became an embarrassment. It tore at the moral authority of the U.S. and it, above all showed the cost of the, of, of the of promoting democracy the hard way. It showed the cost of the hard form of democracy promotion in the form of the very real material consequences of staging military interventions 
for the purpose, apparently, of promoting democracy. And I told you already that that intervention did not lead to the installation of democracy. In fact, it led to dissension, it led to conflict, it embarrassed the United States, and it did not lead to democracy taking root in Nicaragua. And in fact, you could argue that it set a path that would be difficult to break from, a path of violence, repression, conflict, um, and in general, non-consensual and non-cooperative ways of resolving disputes. We know that democracy above all is about really conflict resolution and creating institutions that, that can make decisions effectively but peacefully and avoid conflict between actors. In the United States case, intervention in Nicaragua both undermined the US policy and undermined democracy in Nicaragua. So there was no democracy promoted. There was no democracy to speak of. In fact, it became a, a real crap show for everyone involved. There's also the case of Cuba. Now that the US imposed the, the Platt Amendment in 1903, the Platt Amendment allowed US intervention for the, pres the preservation of Cuban independence for the maintenance of a government adequate for the protection of life, property, and individual liberty. And so you'll you go back and you find uh, this is actually from 2019, but it's a, a sort of characterization of cartoons from that era. And what you would see is stuff like this, where you see like you know the patriotic Uncle Sam with a loudspeaker with a, a to-do list for Latin Americans who are chained up and um, and and really at the mercy of Uncle Sam. And it's it's a sovereign Cuban nation that Uncle Sam and others want, and that they're calling for through this loudspeaker. But the the sort of the kind of bumbling heavy handedness of the whole thing is expressed in this cartoon in the proportions of Uncle Sam, in the volume and the, the sort of intensity of the message, and it really the, the kind of heavy handedness and the repressiveness of the entire thing. And really, this is the situation in Cuba, too. It was a heavy handed and, and repressive approach. So the Platt Amendment justified interventions in 1906 to 1909, 1912. 1917 through 2000 to, to 19, 1922, excuse me. But it did so under the guise of promoting and preserving liberty, property, etc. cetera. Uh, this kind of window dressing of democratic righteousness, concealing a whole host of interventions underneath. Now the case of Cuba got really more interesting in the 1920s because it was then that a new dictator came to power in Cuba, Gerardo Machado, who was himself very repressive and violated constitutional guarantees. Now that mattered because the Platt Amendment, remember, was all about preserving life, liberty, and the protection of rights and liberties in property, etc. Machado was very repressive and violated all of the above. But what he did do was he brought stability and he protected those foreign investors, in particular the US investors who had engaged in extensive business and commercial dealings in Cuba. They had extensive interests and a lot of skin in the game. They had interests and a lot to lose if the United States did not support Machado and if the United States did not sort of table democracy promotion temporarily in the name of preserving its interests. So this was really a test. Would the United States adhere to the Platt Amendment? And would it denounce Machado? Would it throw Machado from power? Or would it hold the line and sort of try to strain to remain true to, to the Platt Amendment? I think that you know the answer to the question. Almost inevitably, many of you are saying, well, no they would not adhere to the Platt Amendment. In, in fact, they didn't. The US held that it applied only to foreigners and not to Cubans. And so this was a real stretch because that meant then that the Platt Amendment was set up specifically to preserve the interests of foreign business people and foreign interests, especially US investors who had business dealings in Cuba. Cubans themselves, well, good luck. You know, you can deal with this on your own, deal with the repression leveled against you by Machado's government. We won't be there for you, but we do care about the interests of, of US businesses. 
And so where the Nicaraguan case showed the sort of consequences, political and material and other, for the United, the United States of the hard variant of democracy promotion, this showed the ethical dilemmas associated with that, with that variant of democracy promotion, the, the obvious conflict between promoting liberty and looking the other way when a, a violent dictator represses the domestic population, but is supportive and favorable to US interests. There's also the case of the Dominican Republic. And the Dominican Republic is another example that is alarming because it shows the kind of heavy handedness of the hard variant of democracy promotion. And in Dominican Republic, what we saw was that even when an elected official was in office, if they did not conform to American ideals, they were threatened by the US through a US backed coup. So one example was when the Dominican, Repo Dominican Congress elected President Carbaja, Enrique Carbaja. Now, Washington refused to recognize his government unless he signed a new treaty granting US control, not only of customs, but also of the treasury, the army, and the police. And so in other words, they would only permit him to take power and would recognize him as the rightful government if he basically handed over all the key economic and coercive institutions of the state to the United States itself. Now, the Marines who had been dispatched to intervene and to march on the Dominican Republic did not leave the country until the US regained control over Dominican leaders by placing the command of the military government and the local forces under the control of American officers. And so in the end, they would not allow Dominicans to choose their own democratically elected or anointed president unless that president was willing to sign over control of key institutions that related to the protection of US business interests. And so once again, in Latin America, during the first wave era, democracy promotion seems to be concealing the promotion of the rights and the interests of US investors. And so let's take a look at some quotes in context. So Woodrow Wilson, president from 1913 to 1921, once said, I'm going to teach the South American republics to elect good men. Now he did not teach them, uh, but he did pressure Latin Americans to bend to his will. And so, as has been pointed out, most US interventions displayed a consistent pattern. Military forces would arrive amid considerable fanfare. They would depose rulers, often with minimal force. They would install a hand-picked provisional government. They would supervise national elections, and then they would depart, mission accomplished. Now, what you see there is a pattern of intervention in a pattern of external sort of sort of uh, tutorial control, tutelage, if you will. That doesn't seem to grant the countries themselves any influence over their, over their own democratic process. And so even in those moments where democracy promotion involved what was ostensibly political actions, the removal of presidents, the installation of successors, the supervision of elections, all of these activities strayed from what we would consider to be democratic. And the context, again, is that the United States has amassed considerable business and economic interests in Latin America. And the protection of these often means making democracy play second fiddle to economic considerations like the preservation of, of the foreign interests in those countries, keeping the governments or the states from engaging in expropriation or imposing policies that would be harmful to US business interests. Frank, Frank, uh, President Roosevelt himself said, there are points of resemblance in our work to the work which is being done by the British in India and in Egypt, by the French in Algiers, by the Dutch in Java, by the Russians in Turkestan, by the Japanese in Formosa. Uh, and this was a confusing point because in the US itself, women had to fight for suffrage and black Americans still could not vote. And so this is yet another sort of contradiction inherent in US democracy promotion during the first wave. That democracy promotion was taking place at a time when the US itself was an imperfect democracy, where rights and liberties were not shared equally, where Jim Crow was in full force, where black Americans could not vote and were subject to far worse treatment 
where women had to fight for the right to vote, where it was still a new right, and in general, where democracy was incomplete. And so if you needed any more evidence to doubt the sincerity of democracy promotion, at least during the first wave era, well, this appears to be another piece of the puzzle that falls into place. And I just wanna again point out the kind of imperialistic nature of this and the way that there so often appears to be a set of hidden objectives or hidden motivations that, that propel uh, these decisions. So this would be the this this would be the first Roosevelt. Now, we just focused on the first wave of democratization. Obviously, there are three waves of democratization, and I'll tell you right now that in a moment we'll take a look at the third wave of democratization, and we'll again return to Latin America to focus on U.S. Latin American relations and zero in on that as a case study. But before we do that, I wanna ask, how has US democracy promotion changed since the beginning of the third wave of democratization? So in other words, does democracy promotion today look the same as it did in the period between 1900 and 1933? Or has democracy promotion changed? And then secondarily, I wanna ask you the question, should the U.S. adhere to exemplarism or vindicationalism and why? But let's take on the first question. How has U.S. democracy promotion changed in the time since the beginning of the third wave? I think one of the most obvious ways is that they've moved away from hard intervention and sanctions towards a softer promotion of di diplomatic pressure and threatening of sanctions. Absolutely. And, you know, there could be a number of reasons for that, right? Like, you know, raw military intervention is viewed unfavorably by other powers who might themselves judge the U.S. and, and, and punish the U.S. for that. And we know that, generally speaking, there are new kinds of economic integration between these countries. And military intervention is kind of a brute, heavy-handed way of addressing what might be dealt with more smoothly from the vantage point of preserving economic relationships um, by using soft means of, of intervention and soft means of promotion. What are some other ways that US democracy promotion has changed since the beginning of the third wave? Apart from moving away from hard intervention and towards soft intervention. Well, another way that it has changed is that the United States has increasingly turned to um, sort of governmental agencies. They've moved away from, say, using you know, the administration itself, the presidency itself, to using the Agency for International Development, to using foreign agencies that are involved in, in maybe distributing foreign aid. They've often tied foreign aid to democratic reforms. They've made it often conditional on different kinds of changes. So not only has there been a shift from hard to soft democracy promotion, but there's also been a change in terms of some of the key components of the government in the state that are involved in this actual promotion. And there's probably a good reason for that, which is that I think that generally speaking, since the beginning of the third wave of democratization, it's become much more costly for states like the US and others to appear interventionist. And so they want to use things like foreign aid and other levers as much as possible because those are a little bit more legitimate than say, 
just this kind of like heavy handed blunt um, sort of issuing of threats that might come from say a president or his team negotiating with, with the government of another country. In general, it's become softer and the actors involved have changed. It's also become less common. Now clearly we've already established that the US and other countries usually push for democracy in other, other states, but the extent to which they get involved in that activity has sort of been drawn down in the period since. And one reason that might be is because there are just far fewer democracies today than there were then. And so in a sense, there's less work to do. But I've, so I've given you three reasons. Uh, on the one hand, as Ishan points out, there's been a shift from hard to soft democracy promotion. Secondarily, there's been a shift in terms of the key actors involved, a movement away from presidents and cabinets and ministers and towards federal agencies and, and foreign aid distributors, so on and so forth. And then thirdly, the, the sort of extent to which democracy promotion is engaged in. The United States is engaged in less democracy promotion today than they were then, uh, presumably because there are more democracies today than there were then, and presumably because US economic interests are increasingly centered in states that are already democratic. And so that was not the case then. Now let's begin to focus on the third wave era. Actually, you know what, hold on. Um, we'll come back to that. Samantha says, over time, the US has been losing its grip over the world. The third wave was the first time the US was forced to acknowledge it. We could clearly see it with China and North Korea. Good, Samantha. So this is also something that is relevant that I didn't mention, which is that the United States as a superpower has been slowly in decline. In terms of the raw power and political influence of the United States on the world stage, there's been a decline. In particular, since the, the 2000s, when the sort of collapse of the Soviet Union gave way eventually to the rise of China, during the 90s, it was a unipolar world in the sense that the United States had kind of won the day, the end of the Cold War, spelled the collapse of the Soviet Union. But by the 2000s, China was on the rise. And China in the resurgence of Russia to an certain extent, these changes have weakened the United States and it's become more difficult for the US to use a lot of these tactics effectively. It's been more difficult for them to cast influence. It's been more difficult for them to, for example, shape the policies and the governments of Latin American countries. The period between early 2000s and the mid 2000s teens in Latin America was a period of unprecedented leftist government in Latin America. And you better believe that most of those leftist governments were not receptive to US influence. And so even if the United States was, was seeking to promote deeper democratic reform in those countries at the time, those governments were not responsive to the US influence because they didn't have to be. They didn't have to be, simply put. The US was not the sole power broker anymore. And the waning influence of the United States has meant then that their democracy promotion is less potent. But let's focus on the third wave era. The first Bush administration, the Bush senior administration and the Clinton administrations promoted democratization in Haiti. They criticized authoritarian uh, moments or episodes in Peru and Guatemala in the early 90s. They applied pressure against coup mongers in Peru, Venezuela and Paraguay. The 1989 invasion of Panama ousted the dictator Manuel Noriega and led to the installation of a government that had been denied office through electoral fraud. In all of these cases, we see democracy promotion, but one of these examples stands out from the others in a way that might surprise you. When you look at this list, does any of this come as a bit of a surprise after the discussion we just had about the changes in US democracy promotion since the beginning of the third wave? <clears throat> Does anyone want to take the mic and, and point out what st sticks out to them here after our last, our last slide? So Ishan has pointed this out in the chat. The 1989 invasion of Panama was, was an example of hard democracy promotion. 
a, a lone example of hard democracy promotion in the third wave era or a very rare one. Because remember, we just talked about how there's been a shift from hard to soft democracy promotion and how that shift has meant a winding down of coercive means. In the case of the 1989 invasion of Panama, we saw a sort of resurgence of hard democracy promotion. The ousting of, of Noriega, the installation of a government, not just the installation of a government that was not democratically elected, but one that had been denied office through electoral fraud. And so this is important because it means that in some circumstances, there's still a role for military intervention, even in an era where it's less attractive and, and less acceptable than ever before. It might be an interesting paper, for example, investigating why hard democracy promotion was used in 1989 in Panama, but soft democracy promotion was used in cases like Peru in 92 and Guatemala in 93. What would explain that difference? Why is it that democracy promotion took different forms in those different cases? Or more importantly, what is it that explains why hard democracy promotion was still used one more time during this period? That's an interesting question, an interesting deviation that someone might look into. Now, in all of these cases in the third wave era, the US used a combination of soft democracy promotion. Now, in the case of the Panama instance, they also used hard democracy promotion. But in those other cases, the US used diplomatic pressure, public pronouncements, economic sanctions. All of these were instruments that they used to try to bolster democracy and hinder authoritarian regimes. Now, several US agencies, like the Agency for International Development, have also tried to foster democracy in Latin America by making foreign aid conditional upon democratic reforms or, or deeper democratization. And these agencies have been important because they've taken some of the heat off administrations. Of course, agencies are part of the administration itself, but there's something about it that's less public uh, when a US agency as opposed to a US administration uh, makes a very um, decisive stand on, on democracy promotion issues. Now, I wanna go back to a question. This is a normative question. And the question is, should the US adhere to exemplarism or vindicationalism? Now, remember that exemplarism is the idea that the United States should not engage in democracy promotion and instead should develop its own institutions and values and then let them serve as an example to the world. Vindicationalism, on the other hand, agrees that the US is a shining example, but goes further and says that the US has a duty to implant its institutions and its values elsewhere in the world. And that, th that this means above all, promoting democracy. The question is, should the US adhere to exemplarism or vindicationalism? And I'd like to hear from you, and I'd like you to explain why you think the US should adhere to one of these over the other. And that can help us to kind of unwind the issues involved here and discuss the implications and why this matters. And so let me hear from you over the mic, through the chat, however you wish to contribute. So I think in my opinion, the US should pursue um, exemplarism because as we've seen through the past, uh, vindicationalism uh, has ended in not necessarily fully democratic transitions um, and usually softer, more nuanced transitions work in, at least in the case of Latin America where almost all of their democratic transitions were transaction based rather than rupture. So it's demonstrating that nuance being uh, valuable to uh, moving away from authoritarianism to democracy. Yeah, so, you know, one interesting point that Ishan makes here is that in Latin America where most of the transitions were transitions through transaction, there may not be a lot of space 
for intervention from abroad, you've got well-established domestic actors who are engaged in these negotiations over the future regime. Is there a role for U.S. intervention in that case? Or is it more of a process of those actors learning from the example of the United States on the assumption that the United States does serve as an example. And that's a separate question, by the way, too. Does the United States actually serve as an example? <laughs> is that true? Is the United States actually an example of, of, of democracy that we should aspire to? Or is that a flawed assumption that's baked into this entire viewpoint? That's a question that I would, I would like to hear from you about as well, if you have an opinion about that, because that's an important issue that's an assumption that's baked into this normative perspective that we might want to scrutinize. But Ishan is pointing out then that maybe exemplarism works better because it's more nuanced and, you know, maybe also for reasons that relate to, you know, the sovereignty of these, these new democracies. If sovereignty really is a value and if independent decision-making and autonomous decision-making in these countries is essential to a democracy functioning, the democratic transition itself should probably begin through example as opposed to through vindicationalism. But can we make an argument for vindicationalism? Can we find a way of arguing that there is a role for US democracy promotion? Can, any, can anyone think of a circumstance under which it might be appropriate and desirable to use vindicationalism or to actively promote democracy, in other words, in, in some other country? I can think of some, but I'd like to hear from you. Um, I'd say that the only appropriate situation is when those other nations ask for the U.S. Is financial support or any kind of actual participation. But in most of these cases, they're not asking for U.S. interventionism or military intervention and the US does that of their own of their own free will. I see. Good Daisy. So Daisy's pointed to a situation where the country itself still retains its autonomy and its agency. It can decide on its own. We want to ask for this support or this democracy promotion. That's a great example. In which case maybe the US would be inclined to help and maybe in return the U.S. could extract some benefit of its own um, as, a, as a price to pay for win winning the support of the, of, the, of the United States in that process. Good. That's a good example. Good argument, Daisy. Um, another example might be when um, the U.S. has fought an international war with some other country or some third country, and maybe... Uh, the U.S. and that third country win that war, and maybe there's a transition to democracy back home that takes place afterwards, and maybe those who promote democracy in that third country also call for or request democracy assistance, or maybe they just find themselves um, outgunned by the opposition to democracy. Now, maybe it's more it's more difficult to argue that the U.S. would have a role in this case because there's no consent necessarily. Um, but at a minimum, you can see how there might be some pre-existing relationship that could create a, a channel for U.S. involvement or that could make it easier to legitimate U.S. involvement. Um, you know, maybe it's the case that it's a highly repressive dictatorship and the opposition is, you know, the victim of these abuses and has to overcome an uneven playing field maybe in that case, there can be a moral justification for US democracy promotion, supporting the opposition, helping the opposition to organize itself to combat the regime. And if the opposition itself asks for that support, the argument for that interventionism or that democracy promotion might become even stronger. And so one example is Venezuela, where it's well known that Juan Guaido and the opposition movement that he represents as a part of the former, at least, I, think, I think former, maybe still the president of the Venezuelan assembly, asked for the support of the United States. And that request for support was heeded. But of course, the US 
has viewed the Venezuelan case with great hostility. And there have been discussions about even using hard democracy promotion in the case of Venezuela, even moving beyond some of the soft democracy promotion. Can anyone else think of reasons why we should adhere to either exemplarism or vindicationalism? Um, <clears throat> hey, um, hey, Professor, just kind of wanted to um, go back to your question of exemplarism um, even being, like our democracy even being exemplary. Good, yeah. And, uh, I just kind of wanted to briefly talk about ca campaign finance and, um, you know, how some interests could be put above others um, if, you know, a certain campaign gets enough money. So I think that that's also like, that's a soft form of corruption, not, not because like, you know, those politicians wouldn't have voted in that way regardless, but I think it's, it gives a lot of uh, politicians different, um, you know, different forces that they have to deal with other than only their constituents. Yeah, they respond so, to their donors, yeah. Yeah, so I think that, um, I feel like that kind of undermines the democratic process because then the donors have a uh, have a um you know larger you know ability to influence the interest of those politicians and how they um you know create legislation Vindic Good. yeah vindictionalism is um it seems to be needed in like violent and you know very horrific circumstances but um you know the united states has always very much um, taking advantage of any country that they've given or supported, given help to or supported. So I think that, um, you know, it's always like our interests first, like our democ uh, our um, U.S. interests first uh, globally. So I think that um, sometimes it is needed, but, um, you know, hopefully it's not, you know, needed as much because they do end up, you know, taking advantage of that region. Yeah, that's a really good argument, Joel. I mean, what about the, the U.S.'s democratic credentials? And is it true that the U.S. is, in fact, an example? And I think that there are many, many arguments we could make to, to support the claim that U.S. democracy ha has deteriorated and the democratic institutions, questions of responsiveness and representation, all are, are, are sort of in, in question. And if the U.S. is still an example is maybe in question. And so we should really think critically about whether exemplarism has a, a, a sound basis in the first place. And that also implicates vindicationalism, because remember that vindicationalism also accepts the argument that the U.S. is an example, and so it should therefore intervene and promote democracy elsewhere. Anytime we question the democratic credentials of the U.S., we're undermining or questioning both exemplarism and vindicationalism. And so it's good that we're having this discussion because we're seeing then that there may be some flaws or some blind spots in these perspectives. The final question I wanna to go to is one that we'll return to on Wednesday, but I wanna put it to you before we leave so that I can put it in your head and so that it's something that sticks with you. And the question is, does democracy promotion promote democracy? Yes or no, and why? In the case of the United States, we saw that whether it does or does not it has often depended. We can't really be certain that it has had any impact at all. And in fact, it seems like authoritarian rule has been, has been sustained in many cases, especially during the first wave of democratization. And so then when we consider that, in addition to the fact that exemplarism may be itself flawed and vindicationalism may be itself flawed because of assumptions about the superiority of US democracy, the question of whether democracy promotion itself is valid becomes relevant. And I want you to think critically about this and be prepared to critically assess this question and think about this from the vantage point, not just of sovereignty, from the vantage point of not just the credentials of US democracy, but also in, in terms of, well, the actual results of democracy promotion. Does it actually lead to democratization or democratic survival? These are all ways we can attack this question and we'll do so again on Wednesday when we get back together. You are free to go. You're out of time. And I know that it's um, later for some of you. You're free to go. I'm gonna stop recording it. Um, thank you so much for being here today.
and uh, I'll post these as soon as I can. And uh, I'll see you next.